Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, How to Drive Key Clinical Outcomes for Patients with Diabetes Using Nutrition Therapy. <clears throat> My name is Ryan Kurikos, a Senior Marketing Manager here at Gluco, and we are excited to have all of you join us today for our third webinar in our four-part Diabetes Connected Care. I would like to introduce today's presenter, Marianne Hodorowicz. Besides being a licensed registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified diabetes educator, Marianne is also a certified endocrinology coder and earned her MBA with a concentration in marketing. She is a nationally recognized expert in many areas of diabetes care, and especially in Medicare, managed care, and commercial payer reimbursement. In this capacity, she's worked with hundreds of healthcare professionals and entities, professional membership associations, and government agencies ac across the country. We're thrilled to have Marianne join us today so she can share her wealth of knowledge on nutrition therapy. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it to Marianne. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Ryan. And I want to thank Gluco personally for this opportunity to present this information to you. You know, as a dietitian by trade, my, my first entry into my career path, I'm always excited when I can go back to my first and passionate love, which is nutrition therapy in the world of diabetes. So we do have an hour and 15 minutes, but with the mid-level mid QA, and then at the end of the QA, we're going to try to keep the content review to about uh, 55, 60 minutes and save time for questions. So we have a lot of learning objectives. I am not going to go through these because I want to use all of our precious time to review the key core messages on this nutrition therapy for diabetes. Here's your abbreviations in case you are reading this deck or someone else reads it who's not quite versed in diabetes. And I promise I'm going to try not to put you to sleep. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed here. I just told Ryan I'm in a suburb of Chicago and we're having bad thunderstorms here with um, thunder and hail and oh my goodness. And I'm just, everybody keep your fingers crossed that I don't lose my electricity or then my internet. So let's start with some ADA, American Diabetes Association Clinical Goals for Adults with Diabetes. Um, what's amazing to me is 33 to 43 percent of, of our patients do not meet targets for A1C blood pressure and cholesterol. We'll show you what those targets are in a few minutes here. And only 14 percent of our patients with diabetes, PWD, meet all three targets for the ABCs. A little astounding to me. And nutrition therapy is critical for meeting those targets. And here are the targets for 2020. This is according to the American Diabetes Association. Um, just bear in mind that we want A1C less than seven and pre-meal 80 to 130, post-meal less than 180. Then we have different levels of hypoglycemia, but it starts at less than 70. And then we have blood pressure. We'll get into this later on, the less than 140 over 90, then LDL, triglycerides, and HDL. You'll see these numbers again as we approach the nutrition therapy takeaway messages. I also want to review first the spectrum of key outcomes for our patients with diabetes. You know, educators, dietitians, nurses, oh my gosh, pharmacists, I get asked all the time, Marianne, how do we prove our worth? How do we prove our value? How do we get more referrals? Well, the number one and best way to do that is to track all of these outcomes, the entire spectrum on our patients, our programs, and our providers, and then put them in a summary and send them to your providers and your wannabe providers to prove your value at least twice a year. So if we start in the top left corner, this is a pecking order to the outcomes. Uh, Martha, our patient today, has to start with a knowledge or a learning outcome, and all this can be tracked. I have the forms to do that if you're interested. The knowledge outcome then leads to a behavior change outcome. This is going down to the bottom right. Hopefully that leads to a clinical outcome then a quality of life outcomes, less blurry vision, less tingling in the extremities, less urination, less stress, uh, oh my gosh, better sexual life. There's so many quality of life outcomes, better wound healing. All of that hopefully will lead to cost savings outcomes, less medications, less trips to the physician or the ER or urgent care clinics. And that all wraps around to the bottom left and satisfaction outcomes, which we can measure again patient, provider, and payer. So if you need help with forms to monitor this, please do let me know. This is really how we prove our worth and our value. 
So let's jump into the key clinical outcomes for patients with diabetes using nutrition therapy, how to drive those outcomes. And being the queen of acronyms, I've summarized the key nutrition um, therapy interventions into the word diabetes meal plans. It helps me remember things and it just adds to the more fun part of doing these webinars. I call it edutaining, Educa educating and entertaining kind of combined at the same time. So on the left here is the word diabetes meal plans. And this is all of the nutrition interventions that we are gonna speak to right now. And again, I'm not gonna go through every one. We're gonna speak to one individually, one by one, and you'll see what they are. So let's start with the D and it's up at the top in the title bar. Decrease carbohydrate and teach that a carb is not a carb. Okay, let's look at what the very current research is showing us, especially meta-analysis research. There's several points here. A low to moderate carb diet does lower blood glucose more than high carb. Pretty much all of you know that. And again, don't forget to put your questions in the chat box or even comments. It doesn't have to be just questions. It could be, I like this webinar. I wish it was this way. I have a suggestion. Uh, this is good, keep going. Or even if you have a story to tell about one of these interventions. The greater the carb restriction, the greater the blood glucose lowering. But the ideal amount of carb in the diet is not clear. It is not clear. There is no ideal percent of carb, protein, or fat from calories that's ideal. And we'll discuss that in a few minutes. The fourth point in type two is that low carb diets do improve A1C and lipids in the short term because high sugar, high carb, high sugar, that, that increases triglycerides. But short term, why only up to one year? Because it's very difficult for patients to stay on low carb diets. That's why they say in the short term, because they go off of the diets. There's no ideal percent of carb or protein or fat from the patient's Martha's calorie level. There's just not. So then how do we determine Martha's carb budget? That's what I call it, the amount of carb she can what quote get away with at every meal meaning the carbs that she's eating and still meet a target post prandial post meal blood sugar of less than 180. her carb budget has to be based on an individualized assessment of her eating patterns and preferences her ability her metabolic goals her blood glucose readings all of that plays into, into account but i always call it I think the main thing is having Martha experiment on her with herself. She has a meter at home. We teach her what carbs are and how to count them in different ways, grams, servings, exchanges, handfuls, cupfuls. Teach her the way she prefers. Then she eats various meals for the week, writes down the amount of carbs she's eating with the post-meal blood sugar check. And that that's how she'll learn very quickly how many carbs she's eating and how close or far away she's getting from her target post-meal blood sugar goal. Could be less than 180, or maybe Dr. Miller said it should be less than 150. So that goal can be individualized. Most of our patients though do report a moderate intake of carb, 44 to 46%. The good news is that the low carb eating plan, we do have a definition of that because dietitians, particularly dietitians, want to know the numbers. Reducing carb to 26 to 45 percent, and the average is around 44, 46. So that's a reduction. And the low carb diet is now approved in a joint position statement of the ADA and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. So it is mainstream now in terms of medical nutrition therapy. But what about teaching that a carb is not a carb? You say, Marianne, what is that about? Well, it's true. Here's a study, and we have the graphs to prove it, where they gave type 1 people three different types of um, carbohydrate at their meal and kept everything else constant with the grams of carb and the insulin boluses. But the carb was high protein pasta, white rice, and regular pasta. Let me draw your eyes to the bottom graph on the right. You see the line where it says white rice? This is the bottom graph. And the glucose excursion after the meal, how high the glucose went after these different forms of carb, you can see that that's on the axis that goes up and down, the y-axis. So let's look at the white rice line. That white rice caused the post-meal blood sugar to occur, that rise in blood sugar to occur earlier and higher 
and for a longer period of time. A higher rise in blood sugar uh, compared to the two pastas, and, it, and the high sugar lasted longer for an extended period of time after that white rice was eaten. So what is the key nutrition takeaway? That the post-meal blood glucose peak was higher and earlier with right rice compared to pasta. So our patients have to know this. Not all 15 grams of carbohydrate, low sugar carbohydrate, is going to affect blood sugar the same way. It all comes to patient, in my opinion, patient experimentation with our help and support. Let's look at the next nutrition intervention. Identify the best times to eat our snacks if you have type 2 diabetes. I think this is fascinating. My husband, we're empty nesters. We, we live here in, in a suburb and he has type 2 diabetes. I've got permission from him to say that. And I, I ask him to experiment with a lot of these things that the research tells us and it bears out. So we had patients eating their snacks, afternoon snacks, right after lunch in red and mid-afternoon. And what did it do to their blood sugars for the entire rest of the day? So the red line, again, the higher those lines on that y-axis going up and down, the higher the glucose concentration. The red line was eating that snack, 75 calorie biscuit, right after lunch. And you can see on the red line that the blood sugar went higher. And it stayed higher with that red line, even into dinner, even into dinner. The blue line was eating at mid-afternoon. The glucose excursion was lower and lasted lower for the entire day. So the nutrition takeaway here is that eating your snack mid-afternoon is preferred rather than after lunch. Um, it reduced our glucose excursion mid-afternoon and even after dinner, significantly after dinner. So it has that long-term beneficial effect. Really exciting news. To me, this is really exciting because maybe I'm a dietitian. I hope you're excited as I am. Okay, what about, and again, we're using that acronym, Diabetes Meal Plans. Now we're in the A. Account for high protein, high fat meals. Again, this is all based on research. It's not my opinion or, you know, one person who did this. So we, we looked at the postprandial PP or after meal blood glucose response for people who ate, people with diabetes ate a high fat, high protein meal. And that's in the blue line on the graph on the right. A low fat, low protein meal, which is your green line. And then a high fat, high protein meal, the, the burgundy line. But with that meal, the researchers gave those patients with diabetes the optimal amount of insulin to cover that meal. Okay, and that was done with an algorithm. So they, they were appropriately um, given the amount of insulin that the researchers um, calculated they would need. So you can see clearly on the lines, ladies and gentlemen, that that high fat, high protein meal caused the blood sugar, the glucose is on that up and down axis. It caused that high protein, high fat meal caused the blood glucose to be higher than the low fat, low protein meal. And that, that, that increased glucose response lasted longer throughout the rest of the day. So what then, what are we looking at here? That that high fat, high protein meal increased that glucose incremental area under the curve by twofold. Look at the height of that blue line compared to the green and the burgundy. The green is the low fat, low protein meal. So to achieve that post perennial target glucose, for that high fat, high protein meal, 65% more insulin was required. And we had to split it 30, 70 over 2.5 hours. 30% of it was given before the meal. And then 70% was given um, some time, there's a time element after the patient started eating to get that longer effect of the insulin because that high fat, high protein meal was causing a longer rise in blood sugar. And you, the study is referenced in our reference section, and you could look at the particulars. So we do have to consider the patient on meal insulin, how that insulin has to be um, increased uh, and or split dosing when they eat a high fat, high protein meal. Okay, let's look at fiber, the role of fiber. Oh gosh, you know, fiber, boy, fiber is our friend, that's for sure. 
you know, we know it relieves, helps relieve constipation, helps us to feel full if we're trying to lose weight. But what does it do for type two people with diabetes? It can modestly reduce A1C. And this is really, really good news, but you'll be amazed at how it does this. This is also very exciting. So they did this study on soluble fiber. Now remember, there's two types of fiber, soluble and insoluble. Soluble goes into a solution in a fluid and forms a gel, almost like gelatin before it sets up, it's got that gelling property. That's soluble, that's what we're talking about here. We're in this study, the more soluble fiber with psyllium and beta-glucan, the more fiber the patients received um, over a longer period of time, soluble, you can see the drop in fasting blood sugar and A1C, progressive benefit, progressive reductions with more soluble fiber. So soluble fiber, how does it reduce A1C and blood sugar? It forms this gel, okay? And basically the gel gets trapped in these finger-like cells at the brush border of the small intestine. Glucose is in your small intestine from the food you eat, and it, it goes through the small intestine walls into the blood. But those small intestine walls on the inside have these finger-like cells and the gel gets trapped in there. So the glucose comes up to cross over into the blood, but it has to work its way through the gel first to get into the blood. So it takes longer then for that glucose to get through into the blood because it's got to make its way through that gel, which is now trapped in these finger-like cells at the border, the internal border of the small intestine. Very cool medicine, very cool. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say technology, but pathophysiology, I guess would be the word. So the key nutrition takeaway, now this is total fiber, 25 grams for women, 38 for men, that's total, 14 grams per 1,000 calories, but it's the, that viscous soluble fiber, that gelling fiber that reduces the, the, the speed that glucose is moving into the blood, that is seven to 13 grams a day, that's what we're looking for. So we really have to provide a patient with some type of chart um, to see what that soluble fiber is. Let me show you just really quick here, and I'm gonna go back to that other slide. With psyllium fiber, that's highly soluble. It's one of the highest solubility fibers out there. And you can buy it in powder form, sugar-free orange. This is a sugar-free orange. This is what I take. And you can see that one tablespoon has four grams of soluble fiber. And then there's charts we can give to our patients where you see here the apple has 3.3 grams of total fiber, but only 0.4 grams of soluble. And remember, we want seven to 13 grams of soluble. Now let's go back to this slide. What do we do patients who are on insulin, type ones or type twos, this is the recommendation for carb counting. If the, the dietary fiber, the totality of the dietary fiber on the label is five or more grams. We're asked the patients to subtract 50% of that total dietary fiber grams from the total carbohydrate on the label when estimating the carb grams to be eaten at the meal. So 50% of that dietary fiber, if it's five or more grams, um, is, is really not going to be counted as carb in terms of counting carbs and carb insulin ratios. Okay, now in that in the mode of fiber, as we're talking about fiber, let's also talk about plant stanols and sterols. This is also fascinating. Plant stanols and sterols, they're components of plant foods. You hear the word OL, all, and you hear cholesterol, stanol, sterol. What they do is they block that small intestine absorption of dietary food cholesterol and biliary liver cholesterol into the bloodstream. Um, they do, I mean, this is amazing. So dietary and liver cholesterol are in your, right, in your small intestine and they wanna cross over into the blood and they will very easily. But if the stanols are in the small intestine at the same time the cholesterol is, the stanols will cross over first. They always beat out the cholesterol. And then the blood says, hmm, this looks a lot like cholesterol to me. Anatomically, it's pretty similar, but it's innocuous. It has no detrimental effects in the body. So the cholesterol on the other side says, oh, I guess I don't need to cross over. The body has enough. And the cholesterol then proceeds into the large intestine where we excrete it 
in our stool. So where do we get these stanols and sterols? In plant foods, fruits and vegetables, over-the-counter supplements, and they're added to a lot of margarines and yogurt. Um, like Benicol margarine has the stanols, Minute Maid Heart Smart orange juice. I'm not promoting any brand, so don't worry about that. Just trying to give you some good advice here. And you can see here in this animation that um, the animation on the right, the plant stanol is coming in with pills and it's blocking the little pieces of cholesterol from pushing into the blood where the graph on the right or the animation and I'm sorry, on the left, more cholesterol is going into the blood because the stanols are not there. So on the stanols, we wanna aim for about 1.6 to three grams per day. And you just have to look at the label of the special margarines and the yogurts or the capsules uh, to help our patients determine how they're going to get those stanols. Okay, what about the, uh, let's evaluate the effect of low carb versus high carb breakfast on glycemia. Another really fascinating study. And I wanna give a thank you at this point to um, Holly Willis, who is a PhD RD, who uh, generously gave me permission to use some of these slides with some of these graphs. So there was 27 patients with type two who ate two different breakfasts at, in the morning, a high carb breakfast. And on the graph on the right, it's defined as GLBF for, for dietary guidelines, BF breakfast guidelines breakfast, which was high carb. And then the low carb breakfast was a spinach and cheese omelet. And if we look at the graph, that top dark gray bar going up and down, up and down like a W, that is that high carb breakfast. So you can see that the high carb breakfast resulted in an, um, an earlier and a higher blood glucose post meal response. And that higher glucose lasted the entire day. Just from eating that high carb breakfast, that blood glucose remained higher for the rest of the day. The faded out gray uh, area is the low carb breakfast and the glucose was lower for the entire day. It's amazing. So the low carbohydrate breakfast, it reduced the post breakfast peak and that pretty much we could have predicted, but it also reduced post lunch and post dinner on the same day. That's really fascinating that that low carb breakfast had that residual longer term effect on, on blood glucose for the entire day and then after lunch and dinner. And it improved glycemic variability. We want, that's a new metric for measuring glycemia. We want it to be less than 36% on variability, according to the International Consensus Report on Glycemia and Diabetes. So um, this did low carb breakfast throughout the whole day reduce glycemic variability and kept it more in the target range. Okay, what do we know about meal replacements? This is something we don't usually talk about too much. You know, I taught in a hospital outpatient department for about 18 years in a full service outpatient diabetes program department where we did everything. And some of this was not in vogue at the time, but it is now. Studies show that patients can have significant weight loss with diabetes when they take nutritionally balanced liquid or solid meal replacements to replace their usual meal one or two times per day. This has been proven um, over and over again in studies. Now, again, you know, you see brand names, pictures on the right. We're not promoting any particular brand, just trying to help um, to learn better so we can go back and help our patients. And so what do we know then? There was a great article in Today's Dietitian Magazine. Uh, and the article was really their central core article. You can see on the title, Liquid Meal Replacements. And you probably do want to access that, that particular issue as really good information, gives you the details on liquid meal replacements. They show improvements in glucose and hyperinsulinemia, triglycerides, LDL, and blood pressure. But they have to be balanced. It can't be just any um, granola bar we pick up off the shelf or any kind of frozen meal replacement that's not nutritionally balanced. That's why our patients really need to access medical nutrition therapy and have several visits with a dietitian to learn all these really um, beneficial 
and worthy nutrition interventions that do improve clinical outcomes. And it, when all taken together, I call it the law of accumulation. Uh, you know, you say, well, it reduces A1C by 0.1 or fasting blood sugar by 10%. But when you take all of these interventions together, that's where you get the best benefit. Now, there's some disadvantages of liquid meal replacements, monotony, low fiber. Some have sugar alcohols, which can cause bloating. But that's, you know, we just warn the patient about that, and it's an individual response. So, yes, there's lots to digest here. Are we done yet? And you feel that way now. You have this mouthful of information, right? You're like, am I supposed to be swallowing all this? Oh, my goodness. We're going to take questions in just a few minutes. I hope you're having a good time. You know, why don't you drop in the chat box? Um, just to help us along to see how we're doing, because I can't see your faces, this whole virtual reality thing. I like this, or I put a smile face, or fun, whatever you want to say, or I don't like this. I would just like to hear from you. It's always good. So what about alcohol? Well, the risk of drinking only one drink a day, whatever your beverage of adult beverage of choice, there is a decreased adherence to healthy diabetes behaviors. That makes sense, right? Especially if you're sensitive to the effects of alcohol, meaning you're getting a little loopy, a little high. And the more alcohol, the less adherence. You know, we've all probably been in that situation where the more alcohol we drink, the more we don't care, right? And it's progressive. That's just my terminology. That's not the research terminology. But they also say in the research that moderate alcohol consumption has minimal, minimal acute and or long-term detrimental effects on glycemia. Wow. When my husband heard that, he was thrilled. Some data also show improved glycemia and improved insulin sensitivity, but with moderate intake. But what we really have to focus on here is um, hypoglycemia. This is the thing with alcohol. This is what our patients need to know. Alcoholic drinks can put our patients at risk for delayed hypoglycemia, and this is especially true if they're on insulin or insulin secretatog medications. This is what we're really talking about. Even basal insulin, type 2s on basal. And why is that? Let me explain it in just real simple terms. When we drink alcohol, any of us, our livers consider alcohol a poison, a toxin. So the liver kicks into high gear to detox or get rid of the poison because it wants to keep us alive. Well, the liver has a storehouse of glucose in it, right? But it's so busy detoxing the alcohol, it cannot release its stored glucose when the blood sugar is going down. It cannot release its stored glucose and that can lead to hypoglycemia. So if the patient has already injected insulin, they're on an insulin secretatog, blood sugar is going down. Um, and the liver cannot release its stored glucose when they start drinking alcohol. So they do have to nibble on carbohydrate food when you're on insulin or insulin secretatogs. We must nibble on carbohydrate food so that we don't go into hypo. And we have to understand, our patients have to understand, we have to educate them on the signs and symptoms of delayed hypoglycemia, again, for people on insulin and insulin-inducing medications from the pancreas and to test their blood sugar more often when they're drinking, and to nibble on carbs. Not peanuts or shrimp at the bar, that's not carbs, it's gotta be carbs, because the liver will not release its stored glucose. So here's what one alcoholic beverage consists of, and pretty much we all know that. Sometimes we don't use these measurements though when we're pouring our own, do we? <laughs> okay, now let's talk about, and then we're gonna go into some questions. Free fructose, sucrose, sweeteners, and sugar alcohols. Free fructose, um, that's the, the fructose that's in natural uh, plant foods, like especially fruits and vegetables. Believe it or not, when the carb coming in at a meal is from free fructose in fruits and vegetables, there is an improvement in post-meal blood glucose compared to eating carbs from other foods like rice, pasta, bread, um, beans. It's that fructose in fruits and vegetables, an equal amount of that compared to other carbs that do show us an improvement in postprandial blood glucose. But we have to be careful about excessive intake because that can result in increased triglycerides and other metabolic complications. What about sucrose, sugar, table sugar? That does not increase glycemia to any greater extent than the same amount, isocaloric amount, 
amount of starch, sucrose, or sucrose-containing foods. So if my carbohydrate budget, let's say I have diabetes and my budget is 45 grams at the meal, and all 45 grams are going to be in the form of sucrose, according to the research, my blood sugar is not going to go up any higher for that than it would if all 45 grams were carbohydrate from bread. So if we want sugary foods, we have to substitute them for other carbs in our carbohydrate budget. Non-nutritive sweeteners, um, they're fine. They do not increase blood sugar. They have no calories. We all know them, saccharin, acylfem K, aspartame, sucralose. But whether they definitely lead to long-term weight loss, the jury is still out on that because of some of the other medical and psychological effects of um, sugar-free sweeteners. They can adversely alter our feelings of hunger and fullness. We tend to eat more other foods high in calories because we're having a diet soda. So there's some of those effects that we have to be considerate of. And then we have the nutritive sweeteners, the sugar alcohols. They only have two calories per gram compared to four calories per gram for all the other carbohydrates. They're not as sweet, so more has to be added. Uh, but they have, as we know, these negative GI side effects, gas, bloating, and diarrhea. So, you know, it's funny. When I eat just a little bit of sugar alcohol, like some chocolates that are made with sugar alcohols, um, I get tremendous amount of gas. My husband does not at all. He can, he can eat a whole layer of sugar-free chocolates with sugar alcohol and not have any gas or bloating. But for our patients on insulin, uh, insulin carb ratios, the same as dietary fiber when they're on insulin carb ratios. When the sugar alcohol on a label is greater five or more grams, subtract 50% of that sugar alcohol from the total carbohydrate when estimating the amount of carb grams to be eaten at the meal for those on insulin carb ratios. And that's the same as dietary total dietary fiber. Okay, protein, what are we saying about protein? There's no evidence that adjusting protein is gonna make any difference and improve the health of the patient without diabetes if they don't have diabetic kidney disease. There's no ideal amount of protein that we know of. The jury is still out on that. So the protein goals have to be individualized. 15 to 20% of calories is pretty much average but it does not significantly slow the conversion of carbon to glucose. It does not. People say well, we have to add some protein at the, at the PM or evening snack before bedtime to slow that conversion of carbs, some cheese, some peanut butter. That's not true. If the patient is going into low blood sugar in the middle of the night, then he's not having enough carbs for his nighttime snack or he's got too much medication coming in. So that's a really important point. Now, what about matching protein to clinical goals? Okay, again, a little more information here on a 12-week study. The group that did consume more protein, 30% of calories versus 15, did have improvements in weight and fasting blood sugar. But then the higher protein diets, 25 to 32% of calories did result in greater weight loss and 0.5% greater improvement in A1C. That is really significant but the higher protein diets, higher, much higher, much, much higher. So protein intake can enhance or increase insulin response to dietary carbohydrate. So we have to avoid using carbs high in protein to treat hypoglycemia. We have to have just all carbohydrate to treat hypo or low blood sugar. Okay, let's look about eating non-starchy veggies before the carbs. Really fascinating research. These were CGM studies, ladies and gentlemen, in type 2 diabetes, where they gave a, a group of patients, type 2s, the veggies eaten before the carbohydrate at the meal. So non-starchy. So this, um, you'd have to read the study for the detail, but um, my recollection is that it was um, salad, non-starchy cold veggies, or non-starchy hot veggies before the carb, and then the other group got the, the carbohydrate before the non-starchy veggies. So let's look at the graph. The red line is the carb eaten before the non-starchy veggies. And you can see on the red line, the glucose excursion, the glucose concentration in the blood was higher, not only at that meal, but for the whole rest of the meals for the rest of the day. Just amazing. The green line is eating the veggies before the carbohydrate at the meal. So when I, it's lower, 
it's lower. The glucose excursion is lower post meal and then through the rest of the day at the rest of the meals. So I am now making my husband a huge salad before um, lunch and before dinner because I have a little bit of control here, not all that much, but a little bit. He's retired, so he's home. So the nutrition takeaway is try to eat those non-starchy veggies before the carbs at the meal to reduce that post-meal blood glucose response. That would be an important uh, intervention to teach our patients. Okay, let's look at dietary fats. This is, boy, really fascinating. Uh, replacing only 5% of our calories from carb with saturated fat, no significant effect really on fasting blood sugar, not a big deal, but here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. Replacing carbohydrate with monounsaturated fats did lower A1C. Now just bear this in mind as we go through. I'm going to tie all this together. Replacing carb with polyunsaturated fats significantly lowered A1C. Let me go back here. On monounsaturated fats, it reduced A1C by, by 0.09%. You see that? Over here on polyunsaturated fats, significantly lowered 0.11. It was a greater reduction in A1C and fasting insulin. Okay, so replacing saturated fatty acids with PUFAs significantly lowered blood glucose, A1C, and C peptide. This is really, really good news. And then the polys, the PUFAs, significantly improved insulin secretion capacity from the pancreas, whether it replaced carb, saturated fat, or monounsaturated fats. So what is this telling us? That the polyunsaturated fats are coming out as the winner. So substituting carb and saturated fat, reducing that, and bringing in more polyunsaturated fat at the meal is beneficial for glucose control. So let me tell you, this is a pens up moment, why, why this is. I'm gonna verbalize this. I have my notes in front of me. This is so fascinating. Saturated fats, why they're so bad for glycemic control. Okay, not just for cholesterol, but glycemic control. First of all, they release toxic breakdown products. And those toxic breakdown substances accumulate in organs, especially our muscles, the organs that take up the most blood sugar, right? And it's called fat toxicity or lipotoxicity, and especially in the muscles with all that saturated fat. And that right there increases insulin resistance. Okay, now we have an increased insulin resistance scenario inside the, inside the body. And all that saturated fat with this lipotoxicity in the muscles, it increases oxidative stress and inflammation. And this is important, contributes to the death of pancreatic beta cells. Can you picture this? So that if, if beta cells are dying, that's impeding insulin secretion. So you can see on this slide, when we took out the saturated fat and substituted poly, um, it was on another slide actually, that we had more insulin secretion when we got rid of the saturated fat. So again, saturated fat, um, in summary, increases insulin resistance, especially in the muscles, the main organs that take up blood sugar. It can, create, it can cause more death of more pancreatic cells that produce insulin. And the saturated fat has toxic breakdown products that accumulate also in the organs and blood that causes more oxidative stress and inflammation. So, you know, we know that decreasing saturated fat also reduces blood cholesterol. We're gonna be talking about that. But how many of us actually thought it improves glycemia, it improves blood sugar? So just as a little informal poll, uh, maybe you could drop in the chat box, um, you know, I didn't know about saturated fat and blood sugar, or I did know. Just just for my little informal thing. So are we done yet? And the cat says, no, I'm a cat person, so I have to get cat pictures in there. Okay, what about losing weight? Um, I hope you can see the animation. I tried putting in some clip art that has animation to it, this lady looking at herself in the mirror and she desires to lose weight. I think that is so cool. So achieving a weight loss goal, it's recommended for patients with diabetes if they're overweight to improve A1C quality of life and lower CVD risk. So remember when we gain weight, we just don't accumulate fat under the skin. We also accumulate excess body fat inside our muscles. So it's not just saturated fat that makes its way into the muscles. 
but it's also excess body fat that we gain. And the more fatty these muscles get, the main uptake organ in the body for blood glucose, the more insulin resistance is created in those muscles. So we really do want our patients to have medical nutrition therapy that benefit, Medicare pays for that, most private insurances pay for it, and diabetes self-management education and support. Those two benefits, again, Medicare covered, most insurances cover that, are critical to help all of these interventions be taught and understood by the patient, and also to help with weight loss. So modest sustained weight loss in type twos who are overweight did improve glycemic control, and it does reduce the need for anti-glycemic meds. And modest is defined here, because curious minds want to know, right? Modest is defined as 5% of initial weight loss, and it's again achieved by a calorie reduction and lifestyle modification, individualized meal plan with, with the help of a dietitian. But 7% weight loss, not five, 7% is optimal. 5% is good, 7% is optimal according to the research to improve glycemic control. This is all about glycemic control, improving clinical outcomes. And we know that weight loss is also going to improve blood pressure and lipid levels, high lipid levels, triglycerides, LDL. And why is blood pressure and lipids important? Because for every three people with diabetes, two of them are gonna meet their maker from heart attack or stroke. Think about that. Two thirds of people with diabetes will meet their maker from heart attack or stroke. The last statistic I saw. So controlling blood pressure and lipids is really critical. We're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. So our nutrition takeaway, don't you love the little flashing light bulb? I love that, those animated clip arts. 5% weight loss is recommended. Sometimes that's more doable. 7% is better. 15% or more would be really ideal. So we're going from 5%, 7% to 15. This is all per the research. But that 15, that, that's, that's pretty, hmm, that is pie in the sky. That's really reaching for the stars. So can it be feasibly accomplished, safely accomplished for most people without discouraging them? That's the big question. Okay, what's happening now with dietary supplements and omega-3 fatty acids? N3 is omega-3 fatty acids. Well, first of all, the latest research, and again, every, this is changing all the time. When Glu Gluco um, offered or asked me to do this webinar, I was so honored and thrilled and I remember thinking, well, I've done this before and let me pull up the PowerPoint and see, then go into the research and the ADA and all the other research organizations and see what's changed. And boy, it changes every single year. We have to keep up with this. So vitamins, minerals, amino acids, other supplements, substances that we take as supplements, there's no clear evidence of benefits without deficiencies. So if your body is not deficient in vitamin C, vitamin B, vitamin E, vitamin A, there's going to be no benefit glycemia-wise or risk reduction-wise related to diabetes if you don't have a blood deficiency. And then excessive supplements can interfere with our prescription medications. The antioxidant supplements, E, C, and beta carotene, and I would add selenium to that, the mineral selenium, if you want to jot that down. There's no evidence that high doses prevent diseases. And there's some evidence that high doses are not advised because of long-term safety. Really high doses of antioxidant supplements can be dangerous and can even cause death. So we have to be really careful. Metformin, however, one of our diabetes, long-term diabetes medications is associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. That's something we have to bear in mind. That was actually on my CDE exam. It was the very first question on the exam years ago. So the recommendation is, and my, my husband's on that, to periodically test his blood levels of B12. And if they're running low, again, that's a deficiency, right? Then to supplement with B12 because we want to prevent the anemia and peripheral neuropathy. So getting blood tests for deficiencies is important. but there, And there's also insufficient evidence to support the routine use of herbal supplements. How many times have we had our patients say to us, well, Marianne, I heard cinnamon is going to reduce my blood sugar and curcumin and vitamin D and aloe vera and chromium, even chocolate and garlic. I mean, we hear this all the time. Yes, there's some studies that support that, 
Uh, but then you have to look at the quality of the studies. And but there's other studies who that discount the benefit completely. So it's a yin yang. It goes back and forth, back and forth. Some studies yes, some studies no. But then what what about the design of the studies and the amount of people in the studies? That's the big question. I'm going to give you a wrap up on this just in a few minutes. But what about omega-3 fatty acids, N3 fatty acids in foods? Now, big emphasis in foods. We want to increase omega-3s with food. And when we do, not supplements, in foods, research shows improved lipids and improved glycemia, improved glycemia. Now, why glycemia? Remember, omega-3 fatty acids, look at the bottom in red, are polyunsaturated fats. Remember the benefit of polyunsaturated fats? N3 fatty acids are polys. Remember, polys decrease insulin resistance. Saturated fats increase insulin resistance and lead to the death of beta cells. So that's why N3 fatty acids, which are polys, are going to improve glycemia with improved insulin sensitivity. Now the polys, um, the N3 fatty acids may also reduce very high triglycerides, and that is one of the, the main, stay, main ways to treat excessively high triglycerides where patients get prescription levels of omega-3 fatty acids. And then and again, in foods, uh, when it, it, it comes in through food into the body, it could reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, especially in patients with diabetes. But now the research is showing, ladies and gentlemen, that when we take N3 supplements in a supplement form, not in foods, but in a supplement form, they do not have the same effect as whole foods that are high in omega-3s. They do not have the same effects on improved glycemia and lipid profiles. So um, we have to be careful here how we instruct our patients between getting it in food and getting it in supplements. Okay, so then how do we present information on dietary supplements? Well, first of all, one thing we can say to patients right now, it's the Mediterranean style eating pattern is rich in polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats and omega-3 fatty acids. I mean, you've heard of the Mediterranean style, the popularity of it for several years in a row, it was rated by independent research and uh, medical organizations as the best eating pattern to, to adhere to because of the content that we see here, improving glycemia and blood lipids. So this is my summary, as I promised I would give you. What can we say to our patients when they say, Marianne, oh, I, I got this question how many times? Cinnamon, chocolate, garlic. And it used to frustrate me because I, you don't have time to go through all of this like I just went with you today. You have to do it quick and effectively, right? Especially now in the world of virtual reality. So this is this is my idea. This is not from the research. This is Marianne's 5A framework um, to help the patients understand. Ask the patient's referring provider if the supplement would be okay. I wouldn't want to take that responsibility, even if it's over the counter. I'd want to check with the patient's physician or provider. Advise the patient on the supplement outcome claims as briefly and easily as you can. That some studies showed that cinnamon does reduce blood sugar, but then a lot of other studies show it has no effect on blood sugar. Simple like that. Number three, advise the patient on the results of the studies. May or may not be effective. And then advise the patient on that supplements can take up to three months to be effective. That's true. And then assess if the patient has the ability and the willingness to take these supplements over time, or they can even afford it. So that's a little suggestion. So N3 fatty acids, they're in nuts and seeds, and then they're, of course, in fish, eggs, and meat and dairy products. So that's where we find them. Okay, we, we're gonna talk about lowering blood pressure. We have about five or six minutes on nutrition interventions and some medication information on blood pressure and then blood cholesterol. So let's take a peek at that. Now, this is coming from the American Diabetes Association. That's their um, symbol in the top right of your screen. That's the American Diabetes Association. This is all right now for 2020 and their standards of care for diabetes. So if our patient, Marissa, has blood pressure greater than 120 over 80, 
We're supposed to advise her on lifestyle interventions, weight loss, the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. We have that itemized for you. Reducing sodium down to 2,300 milligrams a day. Increasing potassium, because there's an inverse relationship here. If the body is deficient in potassium, a mineral, blood pressure is going up. So low potassium in the blood, blood pressure is going up. And it's the same with magnesium. Low blood magnesium, higher blood pressure. And the DASH diet pushes fruits and vegetables to get potassium, pushes whole grains to get magnesium, and pushes calcium uh, with dairy. And again, low calcium results in higher blood pressure. We want moderate alcohol, only two servings a day for men, one for women. Oh, I wish I was a man at that point. And then increase physical activity. So those are the lifestyle interventions if you're greater than 120 over 80. But let's say Martha creeps up to greater than 140 over 90. We still want the lifestyle interventions, but now we want titration of prescription medication. We're going to get to that in one minute. But what if she creeps up to 160 over 100? We're still doing lifestyle interventions, and now we have to get to medication again. Now, as a reminder, when we're at this level, 140 over 90, it's usually one prescription medication, one hypertensive prescription medication. According to the ADA, when we get to 160 over 100 or greater, it's lifestyle and then two drugs or a combination of two drugs in one pill, okay? And then measuring blood pressure at every visit. And that includes you dietitians. When you do MNT, includes all the educators who do DSMT. Measuring blood pressure is a standard of care at every medical visit. Now the meds for hypertension, the big ones that we know are ACE inhibitors and, AR and ARPs, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, and the rest. Um, now again, giving an ACE and an ARP combined is not recommended. We don't do both at the same time. This is ADA. This is not Mary Ann, this is ADA, okay? If the patient is starting to show some chronic kidney disease, and we would know that with the albumin to creatinine ratio that's greater than 300, um, we're showing some chronic kidney disease. And so then ACEs or ARPs at the max tolerated dose is the first line treatment. Uh, and it's or, ACE or ARP. Because ACEs and ARPs, which control, help control blood pressure, they are kidney protective. They have the side effect, positive side effect, of being somewhat kidney protective with that chronic kidney disease, that progression. It, you know, it's not the first line treatment to stall chronic kidney disease, but they are kidney protective. So one or the other, if we're showing chronic kidney disease. And that's measured, of course, with GFR. So again, um, patient is between 140, 90, 159, over 99. You start with the single med, an ACE or an ARP. These are or, or, ors, okay? Then we get up a little higher, greater than 160 over 100. Then ADA says to, to pick two of these. And again, these physicians and providers, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, this is their expertise to pick two, the best for the patient, but we never want to do an ACE and an ARP together. But remember, ACEs and ARPs are kidney protective. And multiple drug therapy is often required to achieve blood pressure goals, especially with people with kidney disease. Okay, so uh, basically the controllable causes of hypertension, and this is my acronym again. I think most of us know this. And I say controllable because this is what we could be working on with our patients, right? Let's lose weight. Let's get rid of the high salt sodium, only 2,300 milligrams a day is what's recommended. Let's get enough potassium, calcium, and magnesium because when those minerals are down in the blood, blood pressure is going up, okay? And that the DASH diet pushes fruits and vegetables for potassium, pushes dairy for calcium, and pushes whole grains for magnesium. We want to get rid of saturated fat and high total fat. We want to get regular exercise. We want to reduce stress and smoking. We want to eat lower fat, lower especially lower cholesterol foods, so we don't get the plaque in the arteries, which narrows the arteries and creates more pressure, and reduce our alcohol intake. 
and then take the meds as regularly prescribed. So I said this in a positive way rather than in a negative way, the controllable causes. And again, the DASH diet focuses on a reduction in sodium and trying to encourage the patient to eat more fruits and vegetables, dairy and whole grains to get those three minerals, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And we wanna really reduce that saturated fat and the total fat in the diet. So this is just more detail on how the DASH diet is defined. And I, I'm sure that 100% of you on this webinar know this already, but I wanted to have it on the slide so that this deck is very complete and it can be um, in your resource library, your electronic library, you have a good source to go to. And here again, these are the amounts that you would get for different calorie levels of these really healthy foods in the DASH diet. So maybe hopefully that is helpful to you. Okay, a couple more things before we get into the Q&A. Um, assuring that insulin and diabetes meds are matched to food habits. This is really important. Insulin and meds are matched to Martha's food habits and lifestyle. You know, a key cause of hypoglycemia, you have too little food coming in in proportion to insulin. And hyper, too much blood sugar, you got too much food coming in in proportion to the insulin. And why does that happen? You know, my kids would say when they were young, mom, how come is that? You know, now they're growing men. By the way, they, they both need wives and they live here in well, one lives in Michigan and one lives here in the Payless Heights area of Chicago. If you're single and you're in the 30 some age group, 30 some years old, email me, gotta get them married. Anyway, it's an thinking that, so when we, when we design an insulin plan for a patient who needs insulin, sometimes we don't think about their eating habits or their preferences or the time of the day they eat. And we think they'll adjust their eating habits, they'll adjust their eating times, for the insulin plan. They'll go ahead and adjust how they normally eat and what they eat and when they eat. They'll do that for the insulin plan. That's an erroneous assumption. That is completely erroneous. Nobody wants to change when they eat, what they eat. It's very hard to make eating habit changes, right? So we have to create insulin plans to match the patient's eating habits, not the other way around. Whether the patient's on a flexible insulin plan or a fixed insulin plan, we have to first start with a really thorough assessment. How is the patient eating right now? What is he eating? When is he eating? Is he eating in a truck? Because he's an 18 wheeler truck driver in a gas station. Is he eating at a desk? Um, all that has to be taken into consideration to get that best insulin plan. Okay, and one of the last things is that our meal plan has to be designed with best features. And again, we've talked about this. The best features, this is like a, kind of a summary that we've already talked about. More whole foods, like, you know, we said get our omega-3s, fatty acids, which are polys, in foods, not in supplements, in whole foods, whole grain breads. A high intake of non-starchy vegetables, especially eating those before the carbohydrates at the meal, like a big salad. And then meeting our dietary fiber recommendations, um, 28 grams a day, but if you want to jot down here, soluble fiber, 7 to 13 grams a day, soluble, 7 to 13 grams, minimize added sugars, but if we have sugar, it's okay, as long as it's part of your carbohydrate budget. If you're having 45 grams at the meal and you want to eat um, a little mini cupcake, and that's 20 grams, that's okay, but it's going to be 20 grams out of your 45 gram budget. And we want to avoid in our meal planning sugar sweetened beverages because uh, they're all sugar, right? And flavored waters, which can be all sugar. Uh, more water would be a good deal. Dividing calories into three moderate meals or four smaller meals really does help glycemia. You know, when my husband first got diabetes, he wanted to eat one giant main meal for the day. You know, save up all the calories and the carbs for one giant main meal. That does, that actually hurts glycemia. So the more we can divvy up those meals, the better the glycemic uh, ranges. We get more in target ranges. And again, many meal plans are acceptable. There's no one size fits all. They have to be individualized, but we wanna make note of those best features. Okay, so here are some of the names of diets that have those best features. And you pretty much know that already. Mediterranean and DASH, low carb, vegetarian, it's all good. 
And last but not least, how do we shrink blood cholesterol? More N3 fatty acids, that's polyunsaturated fat, viscous fiber, so that that gel gets trapped in that brush border and the cholesterol has a harder time getting through. Plant stanols get into the blood. The blood says, I don't need any more cholesterol. And the real cholesterol continues into the large intestine where we eliminate it in the toilet. Physical activity will do it. And glycemic control. We have to have glycemic control to shrink blood cholesterol. Because if we have elevated triglycerides, and or low HDL, that affects glycemic control. As we know, triglycerides are directly related to blood sugar control. So, and we may even decrease lipids in patients with diabetes, again, when we control the triglycerides. Okay, we want to decrease body weight to shrink blood cholesterol, and we want to get rid of saturated fat and trans fat, and get those fats down to as close to zero as possible humanly possible and bring in more polyunsaturated fats, particularly the polys. Now, you expect me to remember all this stuff, being a cat person. I've learned that I must learn the newest methods, processes, and technologies so that both I and my patients land on our feet the first time and every time. Again, remember folks, this is changing every year. So I wanna thank Gluco for having the, the insight and the force to do this to help keep us abreast of these changes. I'm sleeping, I'm sleepy after all this information. I bet you feel that way right now. Last but not least, to take back to your practice and use as you desire. Marianne's ABCs of diabetes management. I'm not going to run through these. This is what I do when my husband and I are watching TV and I'm watching oh, a Tom Cruise or a Bruce Willis movie, you know, for the hundredth time some shoot them up thing. So I have a pad of paper and I'm creating acronyms and fun summary type uh, tools. So I only got to J on this one. I couldn't think of any more tools. So if you can go from J to Z, boy, that would be great. I'd love to see that. And I'm gonna let you read this poetry on your own. This is something else I do when I'm watching movies over and over again. But this is all about foods and it's fun. If you had this written out for your patients, they would really enjoy reading this. It's a lot of fun. I think you will enjoy it. So Ryan, I'm going to give it to you. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for our third webinar in Glucose four-part uh, Diabetes Connected Care Series. We would love your feedback on today's session. So please take a minute to complete the survey once you leave the webinar. We'll, we will be sending out the recording and slides to all attendees on, via email. Uh, and if you're interested in attending our last webinar, which is part of our series uh, with Marianne as well, how to successfully achieve DSMES service certifications from both ADA and ADCES, or formerly AADE, uh, you can reserve your seat at the gluco.com slash webinars site. Thank you all and stay safe, healthy, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you joining us and come back for the next webinar we're doing. It'll be a lot of fun. You'll learn a lot. Thank you. Have a great rest of the week. Thanks.